course, because it's much the same language, transcript or transcription seems to be appropriate. You're copying down the information content, perhaps with a marginal mistake along the way. In contrast, though, what we now recognise is we go from a four-letter system across towards a system which is 20 letters, amino acids in proteins. And so we're going from one language to another, the language of nucleotides across to the language of amino acids, proteins. And of course the proteins consist of a series of individual amino acids strung together to give rise to a polypeptide chain with an amide bond between the various amino acids. So you can see that described in translation across the base over here, from the bottom of this slide. That translational process has gone from a four-letter system to a 20-letter system, again making a polymer, a string of amino acids, in this case, the polypeptide, which folds and may be processed further to give rise to the protein of interest. So how do we go from the four-letter system across towards the 20-letter system, the different language of proteins, of amino acids? Well, the answer, of course, is like any translation from one language to another one, we need to have a dictionary. And the simplest dictionary uh, is almost an Esperanto style dictionary, is a universal genetic code. And this classical viewpoint story continues shown on the next slide. You can see now that the genetic code provides a dictionary and the way in which the dictionary works is a series of words. And it comes typically in triplets three letters, three bases each time round are read. So we need to know the correct starting point in this open reading frame. And again, this is an overview story, so you can fill in some of these gaps as you should by a careful reading of your texts. But in this particular story now, the starting point for this triplet now defines for you the beginning of a word. So just like you were to have something written down before you, you would need to know where the starting point is the beginning of that word to be able to read. Most of the time, of course, we do that by having separators between words in a wide range of languages. In other instances, we happen to have clear delineation markers, punctuation points. Now, of course, over here, while there are no spaces, there are clear punctuation points, starts and stops of the very sentences. But to concentrate particularly on the words involved, because it's the major conveyor of information to make these proteins, the way in which this particular chart works is that you read the three letters. And you can then draw the interpretation regarding what a particular amino acid would be encoded by the combination of three within the RNA. So the simplest story is triple U. So the first base is shown on the left-hand side, second base is the table across the top, third base is the right-hand side. And the large U over there, across the left, top left, the, the large U across the uh, horizontal there, corresponds to the second position, and we pick out on the far right hand side amongst a collection of four, the little u. We work our way across, and what you can see there is phi for phenylalanine. So three u's together encode phenylalanine. And indeed you can work your way through the structure and see a wide range of features that include, for example, stop codons, like for example UAA. And I'd urge you to have a look at this because there are the key features. One of them turns out to be that an AUG is typically used but by no means always, to start this process of the production of the polypeptide chain from this open reading frame. So, context, context um, location, open reading frames, all begin to make far more sense. You may wonder, well, are there variations in the language? Well, of course, you just have to look at people and you can start to see how much language can vary amongst groups, even those that live in geographically close communities. Much the same story over here. While that code is used by most living systems, a system which would be far less tolerant of variations, we now appreciate, of course, that there are variations on the same genetic code. So, let's look at two quick examples over here. How do we move from genotype to phenotype? Well, in this first example, you can see an open reading framework provided for you and its transcription to give rise to a transcript and its translation to give rise to polypeptide or protein. Now, I've just provided four codons for you over here, of course, it leads on, which explains a series of dots. ATG, GCT, GGC, TTC. And when it's now transcribed by RNA polymerase, we find a very similar sequence, not surprisingly, used instead of Ts. 
now finally it's translated. So we've gone from transcription to negative translation, and you can see by using universal genetic code, that universal genetic code, which you just saw in the previous slide, is now used, and you can see methionine, alanine, glycine, phenylalanine, metalloglyphe, which then moves on. But of course, genotype and phenotype are not necessarily the whole story. Indeed, one of the most important features of this entire story is what happens when base changes take place. And you can see now, in the second example, the same sequence on the left-hand side, but on the right-hand side now, what the effect of a single mutation is, changing this example, a T to a C. And it might have arisen by, for example, exposure to sunlight. The ultraviolet light might have indeed constructed a modification within DNA, and the cells attempted to repair that, and has eventually ended up by sheer accident now with, for example, a seed that spot. There are other ways, even through the food you might have eaten just a short while ago. Um, there are carcinogens, mutagens within that food. Mutagens give rise to mutations. But by no means always, um, you'd be pleased to hear. So in this particular example, on the right-hand side, now you can see the same sequence with a single variation, a single mutation. What are the consequences? In this example, not surprisingly, a consequence is that instead of a phenylalanine in the fourth position, we get a sear or serine. And you might appreciate that in some instances it may have no effect upon the final function of that protein, but in many instances, of course, there will be some sort of either subtle or more overt effect upon the structure function. Now, we can't just look at these as letters on a piece of paper uh, or on the slides over here. What we now have to appreciate, of course, is that there is a direct consequence moving towards the organism. And one of the neat examples taken from my own work involving elastin research is that, of course, protein and RNA components work together to construct and maintain. And it's not just simply individual polypeptides, but they work together in turn for cellular components, for tissue components, and, of course, for the organism as a whole. And you can see now this move towards the construction of elastin. And briefly, you can see a series of spring-like structures connected by rods in a horizontal sense, shown a series of examples there, almost stacked, partly aligned. And those components are the monomers for elastin assembly. Those monomers, the single building blocks of polypeptides, proteins, called tropoelastin. And tropoelastin here then, um, which uh, sits, as, as I said, as a horizontal array now, is cross-linked. It's linked courtesy of an enzyme called lysyl oxidase, which you can see colored towards, for example, top right-hand side, hiding behind one of the rod-like segments in the horizontals there. And that is intending, by its name, lysyl oxidase, to modify a lysine at a key location or locations in tropoelastin. And by doing so now, it predisposes this entire system to the formation of intermolecular crosslinks. The lysyl oxidase has finished its job and these crosslinks ensue and you can see series of these sitting diagonally between linking these various tropoelastin chains. What's the end result? The end result over here really is now you get this extraordinary bed spring type array of these crosslinked entities which now allows us to have an elastic kind of structure. We find elastin in a wide range of places wherever the body requires elasticity. And one of those key examples, of course, is within blood vessels, particularly the, the arteries, where those particular blood vessels happen to have a distinct requirement now for coping with the peaks and troughs of blood flow. And so, like an elastic system, um, where in contrast to using rubber, now we're using, of course, a protein-based elastic solution to the problem, you can see now where elastin, as some examples, is located within the walls of such a blood vessel. Not surprisingly, damage to such a structure, particularly through mutations in various forms of diseases which have been characterized and are still being characterized, happens, of course, to have direct consequences on viability. In one such disease called supravalvular aortic stenosis, SVAS, there is a